Las Vegas, Sin City, the marriage capital of the world, home to America's most beloved casinos. And in July 2015, the site of what was billed as the largest libertarian conference in the country, Freedom Fest. Thousands of business leaders, politicians, journalists, activists, finance bros flocked to Planet Hollywood Hotel. Among them was Maria Butina. Maria was from Russia, and she was there with her American boyfriend, Paul Erickson, a longtime conservative campaigner. There was his idea to go there. He showed me the American political world. Paul was my guide in this world. So he brought me to the Freedom Fest. There was one last minute addition to the speakers list who was getting a lot of attention that year. And suddenly I start seeing that people are moving in. So they're coming in and they, it's like people like bees, you know, they're like starting buzzing there. This is the reason why there's not a single empty seat in the room. We have a packed house. I've never seen anything like this in Freedom Fest. Maria and Paul settled into their chairs in the celebrity ballroom. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause for Donald Trump. Well, thank you very much. Now, did he say this was your biggest crowd of the weekend? I don't know. It had only been a few weeks since Donald Trump had descended the golden escalator of Trump Tower to announce his run for president. In front of this crowd in Las Vegas, he spoke for about a half hour. The American dream is dead, but I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before. And then took questions. Okay, who are the questions? Where are they? Do you have a mic? That's when Maria, sitting in the front row, decided she should ask a question. So I stand up because, well, who wouldn't do it? Paul, on the other hand, didn't think it was a good idea. He's like, you really want to ask questions? And I was like, of course, why not? Maria wrote her question down on a piece of paper so she could read it when she got to the mic. So I would actually ask properly, meaning my English, you know, because I was quite nervous. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm visiting from Russia, ah, so my question... Putin. Good friend of Obama, Putin. <laughs> my he question... Obama a lot. Go ahead. My question will be about foreign politics. She stood before the mic with notebook in hand a beige shawl draped around her. She wanted to know what Trump thought of the economic sanctions the Obama administration had imposed on Russia. If you would be elected as a president, do you want to continue the politics of sanctions that are damaging of both economy, or you have any other ideas? Trump pointed at her. I know Putin, and I'll tell you what, we get along with Putin. Putin has no respect for President Obama. Big problem, big problem. I believe I would get along very nicely with Putin. Afterwards, Maria excused herself, headed to the restroom, and made a phone call to a senior Russian official. She would later call it, my best report. Maria's question to Trump had been brief and might have been forgotten. But much later, people would look back on that moment in Vegas and ask, who is Maria Butina? Because three years after Freedom Fest, Maria Butina was arrested. Federal prosecutors claim Maria Butina was secretly sent by the Russian Federation to infiltrate political candidates and the NRA. Investigators say she worked to gain access to American political operatives and political groups, including the Trump campaign. I step outside and they put handcuffs on me and that was my last minute of freedom. Maria would tell me she was no secret agent. She was a Russian citizen who came to the United States hoping to build a better relationship between two countries she loved. But the federal government saw something different. I did not expect it, but something inside of me told me that it's gonna be very bad. Because the answer to the question, who is Maria Butina, depends a lot on who you ask. Join Wondery Plus to listen to Spy Affair ad-free right now in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. From Wondery, I'm Celia Anaskovich, and this is Spy Affair. You never could stop. In 
2019, I drove down to a jail in Virginia and sat opposite a very different Maria Butina from the one who had eagerly arrived in the United States just a few years earlier. She was gone, almost sickly looking, her red hair flat and lifeless. It had taken me four hours to get there, but we only had 20 minutes to get to know each other. Those were the jail rules. I had one main question on my mind, one I would keep asking. How would you explain who is Maria? Uh, huh. Honestly, for right now, I don't know. In that moment, I felt for her. Here she was, a woman roughly my own age, at the center of an international scandal. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and over the next few years, I tried to get to know Maria. This is a story that has taken me down a rabbit hole and into a world where trust is in short supply, where paranoia clouds people's judgment, where personal lives are swept up in global politics, and where truth is hard to come by. The truth is, uh, as you Americans say, is in the eyes of the beholder. This is episode one of six. I just met a girl named Maria. A few weeks before Freedom Fest, Lisa Nicolau stepped out of arrivals at Orlando International Airport. The weather was hot and humid, typical Florida in springtime. Lisa began looking for a familiar figure. Paul's very tall, somewhat strange looking, actually. Paul Erickson was in his 50s, tall and balding, except for the untamable tuft of hair that circled his head. My girls say he looks sort of like Ronald McDonald. Lisa had met him six years earlier at their 25-year class reunion at Yale. And despite their differences... I'm extremely liberal, and he's extremely conservative. There are many differences. He also was a member of the NRA. You know, I'm a member of every organization for gun control and gun safety. They became friends. Ahead of the trip, Paul had said he was dating someone new and that he was excited for them to meet her. She was Russian. They'd met on a trip to Moscow about, of all things, gun rights. They loved guns. <laughs> and they apparently, according to him, felt an instant attraction. That's Lisa's daughter, Elena. Lisa and her family were intrigued by Paul's new love interest. For a long time, large parts of his life had been a complete mystery. Online presence, none. Info about his family, didn't really come up. Info about serious relationships? None. It became something of a running joke. Maybe Paul had a reason to be so secretive. We do have a lot of friends who were, you know, I mean, the CIA recruited at Yale. Lisa's daughter, Elena, remembers that Paul had been gushing about his new girlfriend. He spoke about her as if she was like a real wonderkind, and I said to myself, okay, so Paul has a girlfriend. Very interesting. And her name, he said, was Maria Butina. Maria Butina. Naturally, Elena looked her up online. Unlike Paul, Maria had a huge online presence. She was 26, only a few years older than Elena, but she had already founded a gun rights group in Russia. So many of the photos that we saw were her posing with AK-47s and big guns. They were like glamour shots of guns. And there was a strange juxtaposition of a glamorous woman that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be posing with guns who also clearly knew how to hold them. So that was the image I had of her, like a warrior princess. So when she spotted Paul pulling up in a white van... And he's wearing mouse ears up top of his tuft of hair. Elena's attention was mostly on the woman in the front seat. With her long, 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 bright orange hair, wearing many mouse ears on top. Maria was plainly dressed in a t-shirt and jean shorts. On the drive, she began to open up. I loved hearing stories about growing up in Siberia. It's a um, town called Barno. Uh, some people say it's a big town. Uh, some people in Russia would say it's kind of quite small. Maria seemed to have a sense of humor and a passion for politics. She said that she loved being in the United States because she was able to speak her mind freely and she could make fun of Putin and that she didn't really like him. At Disney World, Maria was just another happy tourist. She seemed 
like a kid. Like she was nine and head over heels for the princesses and the rides and the fun and the lights and the adrenaline. And my girls ran off with Maria like they were schoolgirls, like classmates, and ran off to Space Mountain. Space Mountain was the one roller coaster Maria had insisted on riding. I've always dreamed to be a cosmonaut. You guys say astronauts. They all climbed in, lowered the lap bar, you are clear for launch. and took off into the cosmic blackness. And she looked like dazed, like she'd been hit in the face with like a new feeling. When the ride was over, Maria paused, then made a solemn pronouncement. Maria said, now I understand the true meaning of happiness. I came back to my childhood. I can look at the stars and they were bright and they were close. And this is how I dreamed that someday I'm gonna go to the stars way beyond maybe even now a galaxy. It's like you go to the fairy tale and the world, which is usually very serious and, and tough and hard, suddenly becomes a fairy tale for just a while. Over the five days the family spent in Orlando, Elena and her family came to really like Maria. But they also noticed a few things about Maria and Paul that were odd. My sister, dad, and I played a game of trying to figure out if they ever held hands. We were always, always, always looking for clues as to what was going on there. And the reason I think we were so fixated on it is because they seemed like a very unlikely pair. They didn't walk around like a couple in love. There was no physical affection. There was no kissing. There was no hand-holding. There were no cute names for each other. They rather just had like they were on the same page about something and we didn't know what it was. To Elena, they seemed more like business partners than lovers. And she was struck by a strong desire to ask Maria point blank. Come on, like level with me here. What are you doing? What was she doing? I said, I don't know what this woman's deal is. I don't know what she's going to be. But I know that one day she will be written about and they'll get to say, I was in Disney World with this woman. This political odd couple, the Russian warrior princess and Ronald McDonald, stayed together. In fact, they seemed to be thriving. That spring, they toured the country, attending various conservative and gun rights events. National Rifle Association is set to kick off its annual meeting tomorrow and is expected to bring in at least 70,000 gun enthusiasts. They had visited Paul's home state, South Dakota, where Maria had spoken to a group of young Republicans. And then in July, they headed for Las Vegas to Freedom Fest. Whether Maria knew it or not, it was at this event that she would cross paths with two men who would play major roles in her future. One of them was the future president. I believe I would get along very nicely with Putin. The other was the keynote speaker at the conference. Patrick Byrne is anything but your typical CEO. Patrick Byrne, tall, blonde, millionaire intellectual. He's a three-time cancer survivor, has a PhD in philosophy. A man dubbed the Renaissance man of e-commerce by- Byrne has become a crypto god. And when they did meet, it would change everything. Given everything that's happened today uh, on Wall Street, I think we should pay particular attention to what Patrick Byrne is about to say. Patrick Byrne stepped onto the stage at Freedom Fest wearing a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. Hello, what an honor it is to speak to Freedom Fest. He was there to talk about one of his favorite subjects, cryptocurrency. The crypto technology lets us have, for the first time in human history, peer-to-peer, -peer, trustworthy exchange with total strangers. And that's what, at a deep level, is so revolutionary. A year and a half earlier, Patrick had made his company, Overstock.com, the first major online retailer to accept Bitcoin. This is going to be bigger, I'm telling you, this is going to be bigger than anything you can imagine. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. As I got off, there was a line of people waiting for my autograph or something. I don't mean to say that like beating my chest or something, but occasionally it happens because I'm the messiah of the Bitcoin revolution or something. Anyway, there were a bunch of people waiting for my autograph. Patrick strode in the direction of his admirers. And that's when he spotted her the young woman with red hair, waiting to speak to him.
Just because this pandemic has turned our lives upside down doesn't mean you have to let the new normal of stress and anxiety be your normal. Talking to a therapist is a great first step. It's a signal to yourself that you're ready to be the one in control. By seeking help, you're giving yourself a chance to heal and grow, to overcome the difficulties and uncertainty of the past year. And that's where Talkspace comes in. Talkspace lets you send and receive unlimited messages with your dedicated therapist in the Talkspace platform 24-7. With Talkspace, you set goals with your therapist and they hold you accountable and make sure you're really progressing. Therapy can really help you shift your perspective, find tools to cope in difficult times, and really be a guiding light. And Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code SPYAFFAIR to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's code SPYAFFAIR at Talkspace.com. <laughs> Patrick Byrne had just stepped off the stage when he saw Maria for the first time. She's, of course, striking, not like a typical young girl trying to get my attention, frankly. Much more professional and proud and the way she held herself. She introduced herself as the founder of a gun rights group in Moscow and handed Patrick a business card. The truth is I'm not, unlike probably 97% of the other people in that room, I'm not really a gun guy. To me, they're like having a dog around. They have a certain function in life, but I don't fetishize them. It's just something to have. Patrick slid the card into his pocket, thanked her, and moved on. Then, the next afternoon, Patrick had just finished speaking on a panel of cryptocurrency experts when... This sounds so conspiratorial. When I went, had gone around backstage and walked out through the speaker's area down this sort of speaker's tunnel, <laughs> there she was. It was clear to Patrick that she was waiting for him, again. She had staked out a place, but it wasn't where any of the public would have been. It was a place where no one else was around either. I thought that was interesting. According to Patrick, Maria had a message for him. This time she was very direct and she said, Dr. Byrne, why I'm really here is I've actually been sent from Russia to make contact with you. Then Maria handed Patrick a different business card. This one didn't say anything about guns. It said she was the special assistant to the vice chairman of the Central Bank of Russia. She asked, do you have 90 minutes that you can afford me? I was attuned immediately to the possibility that there was something nefarious or Red Sparrow or whatever. I mean, that was more like a footnote. My main impression was that she was a very serious, sort of a heavyweight of a person and that I had to pay attention to her. And so that's what made me want to take the meeting and get to know her better. The next day, Maria arrived at Patrick's hotel suite. I was alert to the possibility that this could be all kinds of bad things. From eight ways from Sunday, this could be a bad thing. So I had to take precautions. Patrick says his precautions involved a wooden hanger. I took a hanger, a wooden hanger, and broke it and made it jagged. So it's like, so just in case anything went wrong. He placed his makeshift weapon under the sofa. Maria arrived right on time, dressed in a red blouse and skirt. She immediately struck me as, an, as a business executive would, if she was an accomplished senior management, 40-year-old kind of woman. Patrick asked Maria to have a seat, watching her closely to see what she would do. He still wasn't sure what she was up to. And so I wanted to see if when she showed up, she threw it at me sexually. And she seated herself in a way that showed she wanted to have a business discussion and was not trying to get close to me physically. And so... In Patrick's hotel room, with the broken hanger close at hand, they began to talk. We talked about Chekhov, we talked about Shakespeare. We talked about Plato. She knew the U.S. Constitution well, and she knew Mark Twain and Huck Finn. Patrick was impressed by her intellect, and she was apparently well-connected. He says Maria told him, there are 50 oligarchs who run Russia, but there are seven who really run Russia. I am close, very close, to four of them. There were many people in Russia who admired Patrick, she said, and she had been asked to invite him to visit the country. She'd already outlined an itinerary. First, he would speak at the central bank. Then, 
they'd go to a mountain resort for a three-day conference with a group of influential Russians. There would be 40 to 45 people there who would be interested in hearing my thoughts about liberalism and history and politics and blockchain and Bitcoin, and also about the possibility of an improved uh, future between U.S. and Russia. Patrick was flattered. Peace is a good thing. And I was open to the possibility that a better relationship with Russia could be something, you know, a woman with this background and these credentials and the way she carried herself and with these facts behind her, if they checked out, I'd say my interest in peace also had piqued my willingness to proceed further with her. They agreed to keep in touch. Then, according to Patrick, she made an unusual request. She asked that we continue to communicate in order to set up this time in Russia, but that it would be better if we did so under the guise or the convention of that we were arranging romantic relationship between each other. Patrick didn't know what to make of it, but he wasn't not interested. Who the hell knows? Maybe it's she doesn't want the American government to, uh, who the hell knows? It may just be a habit because she's Russian and Russians have lived this way for hundreds of years. So who the, who the heck knows? It was a strange end to the meeting. Maria said goodbye and left. So I understood it was clear between us that she was some kind of an operator. But what that meant exactly was an open question in my mind. It's Patrick's perception. <laughs> I wasn't sent by anybody in Russia. For me, it was suspicious that uh, an American billionaire is talking to me, just a student. Maria's version of what happened is a little different. I tell you the truth, what really happened. And he might think he tells you the truth also, because the truth is, uh, as you Americans say, is in the eyes of the beholder. For a start, Maria says Patrick invited her to a meeting. He offered me to go ahead and, you know, have lunch, which surprised me a lot, because he is a very wealthy man, very smart, and I do believe he has a lot of fans who would love and kill to have a dinner with him. But I guess he was interested in my Russian accent. And she thought there would be other people there. I actually did expect that there's going to be a lot of people. So I, I came in and there was nobody except Patrick. So I couldn't believe what could Patrick, like the, the, the genius, uh, have in common with me, a girl from Siberia who is, uh, you know, like, I am definitely not his level in intellect. She also doesn't recall inviting him to Russia, at least not then. Still, both of them agree that they hit it off at that first lunch. Maria says she left the hotel room that day feeling surprised and excited. Sometimes you have a connection with a person you cannot explain. It's something beyond like the ordinary life that we live every day. This is what I felt about Patrick. But Patrick wasn't ready to let his guard down just yet. He liked Maria, sure. But businessmen like him don't want to be caught rubbing elbows with the wrong person. So he took precautions. Uncle Sam is who I call, and I'm not going to be any more specific. Uncle Sam, the government. Because among Patrick's many interests, Bitcoin, skydiving, philosophy, he says he's also dabbled in diplomacy. On a couple occasions in my life, I got to play sort of the honor of playing a tiny, tiny role in some peace events. As a result of that, I have this legacy clearance. It's a low-level clearance. And so, just to be careful, he says he reached out to his contact in the government to let them know about Maria's invitation to speak in Russia, to keep everything above board. And if something evolved where I was going to Russia and came back, I wanted to let them know so I didn't have a bunch of bullshit to deal with when I came back. That was the idea, at least. But when Patrick did hear back, he claims it wasn't from the same government office he'd tried before. This time, it was from the FBI. thing you need to know about Patrick Byrne. He may be a parachuting, martial arts practicing, millionaire CEO, but he rarely gives simple answers. 
I, for one, am demanding that we liberals reclaim our word. We're liberals. Milton Friedman was a liberal. Friedrich Hayek was a liberal. And direct questions can result in long, winding explanations. Finger puppets of different subterranean powerful forces. And before you know it, he's talking about something else entirely. But... Like, uh, the challenges of being smarter than the general population. Life for us is like doing, pardon me, but it's like doing fucking charity work all the time. Anyway, I'm sorry. Where was I going with that? What did you ask me? And when it comes to Patrick's version of what happened between him and Maria Butina, I heard something that I would hear from a lot of different people. Believe me or not, believe me, that's what it comes down to. And I'm not in the business of proving anything. In this case, the FBI isn't either. They could neither confirm nor deny Patrick spoke to them about Maria Butina. But Patrick says he asked Uncle Sam, should I accept Maria's invitation to go to Russia? Or should I stop talking to Maria altogether? But he says they weren't exactly clear. The responses had been, uh, no, we don't think it'll get you in trouble or cause any problems. And yeah, it might be interesting and a good thing. And if you can build relationships, uh, that's always a good thing. But yeah, we're not too sure. That set off alarm bells for him. The response was half-hearted and indecisive and vague. And if there's one thing that these kinds of people are not, it is half-hearted and indecisive and vague. But he figured they wanted more information before they could decide. And so he and Maria began texting. Her texts were often about videos of mine that she was watching or things I had written that she had looked up and was reading. He sent me um, sometimes some videos and, and uh, I always appreciate his recommendation on books. But they, of course, they had quite um, a bit of romanticism inside. I liked him, and I thought he liked me too. There was one small problem. Maria was still dating Paul Erickson. They'd been together for a few years. Paul had even met her parents in Siberia. And they prepared a very nice breakfast. And uh, Paul was very, very nice to my parents. He brought little gifts. But recently... Things hadn't been going so well. First, I thought maybe he has somebody, I mean, another woman, uh, but it didn't look like this way. But he, he had a secret that I didn't know. And I, I won't say I'm an angel, uh, far away of not being an angel. But when you feel that, that the person who is next to you is at the same time very distant with you, um, you have issues. Patrick says he stayed cautious as he was texting Maria. Suspicious, even. He worried about her motives. Like the time he says she invited him to come to Montenegro for a romantic weekend. Then I'm saying, yeah, right, so your FSB goons can show up and, and uh, put a bullet in my head. Smiley face. These texts were so convincing that I thought, boy, she's good. These texts, you know, the lovey-doveyness, the warmth, and as she, you know, they were the texts of a young woman who was falling in love. And I thought, boy, she's really good. She puts on a good show of this. I just like Patrick. I really did. I have one weakness as a woman. I really like smart men. That's my biggest weakness. And that, I guess, gets me into trouble all the time. According to Patrick, Uncle Sam still hadn't given him clear direction on what to do about Maria. So he stayed in touch with her. And soon, he says, she was trying to entice him to meet again. He says she proposed Rome, then Paris. This went on for weeks. And Patrick was still not sure if he should go ahead with any of this. I didn't want to put myself in the Russian sphere of influence like that with no way to defend myself. So, he says, he reached out to his government contacts yet again with a direct question. I finally communicated back to Uncle Sam, I'm not gonna meet with this girl again until at least you folks tell me green light. So there's no question later. It's an unambiguous signal. That's That was the intent of saying either the words green light are in it or that's it. Patrick waited and waited. Nearly two months had passed. Then in September, he says he got a message. And the words green light came back. A few weeks later, Patrick stood in the lobby of the Bowery Hotel in Manhattan's Lower East Side. Maria had already checked in to the two-bedroom suite Patrick booked. They'd each have separate beds. 
Patrick took the elevator up to the room. I thought what was going to happen is when I showed up at the room, she was going to greet me and I was going to say, oh, you know, uh, Ms. Butina, <laughs> so delightful to get to meet you again. And oh, how funny that we used this subterfuge to meet each other. I would have said, oh, you take the master bedroom. And she would say, no, no, I'll take the junior bedroom. And I, and I thought that was going to happen 90%. That's how it was going to play out. That's what he thought was going to happen. There was something else also between us, and uh, everything was quite spontaneous. So what actually happened next? Well, a gentleman doesn't say. Coming up on this season of Spy Affair. And he says, what's the NRA doing here? And I said, uh, we're just touring. And he says, wow. You guys ought to be careful. You don't want that getting out into the American media. Could be a problem. They see me in an apron. Everything smells like banana bread. And I see all these FBI guys with like full guard with guns and two agents in black suits. And I'm like, hi. But the truth is I'm leaving on a big thing, which is I also saw her as an opportunity to complete the mission I had been assigned in 2006. I think when we first met the first time, I may have asked you this question, but I want to ask you one more time. And the question is, who is Maria Butina? From Wondery, this is episode one of six of Spy Affair, a series about deception, appearances, and the consequences of trusting the wrong person. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. You can follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Episode two is available now, but you can listen to the first three episodes ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. Spy Affair is hosted, written, and produced by me, Celia Anaskovich. Producer is Heather Schreiering. Associate producer is Tracy Egbaz. Hannibal Diaz wrote this story. Fact-checking by Natalie Robumed. Additional production assistance from Daniel Gonzalez, Sasha Beich, and Sasha Adinova. Managing producer is Latha Pandya. Music supervisor is Scott Velazquez. Sound design by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producer is Robert Friedman for Bungalow Media and Entertainment. Executive producers are George Lavender and Marshall Louie for Wondering.